Thank you very much. Uh, so yes, uh, as you said, we're going to be talking about uh, genetically modified tests. So it's an introduction to mutation testing. Uh, so thanks about the introduction. My name is Xavier Goucher, and so you said on almost everything. Uh, you can find me also on all the uh, social network with the same handle, X Goucher. Uh, so if you want to connect after the talk, uh, you're quite welcome. Uh, anyway, let's start. Uh, with a show of hands, uh, who here um, use or knows about unit testing? Everyone, great. Uh, about integration testing, functional testing, great. Test-driven development, good. Code coverage, mutation testing, good. So you're. <laughs> You're, you're in the right room. So anyway, uh, let's start with the premise of this talk is that code has bugs. We all know that. No, you, no one has ever written uh, bugless code. And when you write your test, it's written in code also uh, most of the time. So of course, this means that tests also have bugs. And so the, the goal of this talk is to know that if the tests are there to ensure the quality of your code, What's going to be there to ensure the quality of your tests? So let's start at the beginning. Uh, we're going to talk uh, briefly, uh, for those of you who didn't show your hands, uh, about uh, everything. So basically, unit, unit testing. It's like a single musician passing an audition. You know, it's just making sure that on his own, he does know how to use his instrument. Uh, then after that, you have all the integration testing. You're going to have a couple of musicians working together and making sure that they have the same rhythm, that they are in harmony. And then you have the functional testing. You're working with the production code. Uh, it's much like uh, a dress rehearsal. You have all the musicians on stage. You have the lighting. You have all the effects, making sure that the uh, full show works perfectly. So we, if we keep with this analogy, uh, test-driven development is ba basically just writing the score beforehand uh, instead of just improvising the music until it actually sounds good. And code coverage uh, is basically the idea that you're going to make sure that the, the test, uh, you're, you're testing that every note is played correctly. So when you're launching your test, code coverage is just making sure that every line of code uh, is seen by one or more tests. The problem with code coverage is that it's imperfect. You can have your tests with 100% code coverage, and yet you're not actually testing correctly. So this is a perfect example of what I mean, it's that uh, to have a 100% test coverage, you just need to call your code. The code coverage just says, when I run the test, this line of code is called. The statement is called. It's run through in the JVM. But the code coverage doesn't tell you if your tests actually verify anything. So there are some issues with that, uh, because uh, some people, some companies I know, uh, use the code coverage as uh, a KPI, uh, and they, are measure, they measure it, and they have objectives on the code coverage. And the problem is that when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure, uh, because the code coverage is very easy to fake. You just need to have your tests calling your code, not testing anything, just call your code, and you're going to run through all the statements, and very easily you're going to have 100% code coverage, but you're not testing anything. And uh, this is a, a correlate of the Goodhart's law. It's the Campbell's law that the more any indicator is used for decision making, the more subject it, is to, uh, it will be to corruption pressures. So basically, when you say, yeah, we need to have 80% uh, code coverage, we need to have 100% code coverage, don't worry. You're going to have 100% code coverage, but you're not going to test anything. So anyway, uh, code coverage just tells you that you run through the code, but it doesn't tell you if you are testing anything. So we're just going to take a, a small parenthesis on the goal of tests. Uh, the main goal of tests is to verify that the code works. Okay, it's the basics, uh, but it's not the only reason to write tests. Uh, one of the main reasons, I think, is to make the contract explicit. That is, when you write the test, you are actually writing in 
in code what your feature, what your class is expected to do. Uh, and it's uh, a stronger contract than all the specifications that you can have on a wiki because it's actually run. Uh, it also helps to guide the development, especially if you're working with TDD. Uh, so if you know the contract, it's going to guide how you're going to develop the feature, and you're not going to develop any um, unneeded features. It's also useful to prevent regressions caused by other developers or just yourself in the future. And the, one of the other things is to ensure the re retro compatibility. Uh, basically, when you have uh, other developer, uh, when you have, uh, um, let's say, uh, um, an old format that you need to parse, and you change the parser or you, uh, you add a new format, you need to stay also compatible with the old formats. So it's mostly uh, the last uh, three or four points that we're going to be interested in when you, we talk about mutation testing is to ensure that the test actually catch uh, regression or uh, retrocompatibility issues. Because bad tests can give you a false sense of security, and you need to be as confident in the tests you code that you are in the code you test. And you can actually quote me on this one. So this is where the uh, mutation testing comes in. So we're going to take a look at the basic algorithm of mutation testing and how it works. Basically, mutation testing 101 is first, you write your test. You all do that, so that's very good. Then you mutate the code. We're going to see uh, just later what it means. Then you watch the test fails. And of course, you profit afterwards. <laughs> so when I say you watch the test fail, basically, you need to see your test as your security team. The tests are there to catch any bug or any issue in your code. And mutation testing is not going to find bugs. It's just going to run a security drill. It's going to say, hey, let's say we, we make your code bad, and let's see if the test catch actually the bad code. So step one, write the test. So it's pretty easy. You just make sure that all the tests is green. Step two is mutating the code. That is, you make one or more modification on the source code. Uh, and Hopefully, a mutation, a modification of your source code should make your, the behavior of your code change. And if the behavior of the, the code change, the test should fail. Okay? So when you say you mutate the code, it's really you, you, you mutate your production code and not the test code. You mutate the, the source code of your app. And so let's talk more about what's a mutation. A mutation is a, a modification of a statement in the code. So basically, anything that is a, say, is a statement uh, in your code can be modified. Uh, some examples can change the math operation. So for instance, if you have uh, A plus B, you're going to change it into, into A minus B. If you have A times B, you are, you're going to change it to uh, A divided by B. You can change the condition boundaries, like um, you change uh, a greater or equal into just greater. Uh, you're going to change equals into not equals, uh, stuff like that. You're going to change the Boolean conditions. You're going to change the constant values. So for instance, if you have uh, uh, an integer value, you're going to change its value. Uh, you're going to change the return statements. Say, for instance, you are going to say, well, this method is always going to return nil. And will the test catch it? And of course, there are a lot more uh, kind of mutations that you can have. So step three, you run the test again, and you watch the test fail. Because you changed your source code, the test should fail, because the behavior is not the one you expect in your test. So at least one test should break for each mutation that you introduce or not. So why would a mutation die? Well, pretty obviously, you can have the test condition fail. So the mutation will change the, return, the output of the method you're, te you're testing. And so your test condition will fail. You can have an unexpected exception, because the mutation will introduce a, a null pointer. It will change the size of an array. And you're going to have an uh, index out of bound. Um, you can have non-viable code, even though most framework uh, try to avoid this, because you are going to change the code. Sometimes the code won't compile at all. Um, 
you can have a system error. That is, um, you can have a memory error because you're going to allocate much more uh, memory than you required, or you're going to have um, a stack overflow. And you can, of course, have a timeout because the end condition of the loop cannot be met ever again. Now, more interestingly, why would a mutation survive? Because this is where the fun happens. A mutation can survive because, first, it's uncovered. So basically, if you have uh, a line that, or a method that is not covered by your test, obviously, any mutation in this method won't be detected by your test because no tests run through this method. You can also have a silent mutation. So silent mutation is very tricky to detect because um, it's a mutation that changes the statement in such a way that it actually still does the work. To give you a concrete example, I had this issue myself uh, on a, um, a program I wrote, and I, I had a method that did some uh, math on a couple of variables, and at some point I had um, uh, I took A plus B modulo something, uh, modulo C. And the mutation just changed my A plus B to A minus B. And the thing that I discovered during my test is that B was always a multiple of C, meaning that even changing A plus B by, into A minus B, it, was, it will always give the same result with the module next. So basically, the change uh, didn't, uh, the, the mutation didn't change anything in the logic and the, the code was still correct because actually my two variables were linked and it actually helped me to find a better and faster algorithm for this specific problem. But yes, silent mutation can still happen and it's not a bad thing, it's just sometimes uh, it, uh, it happens. And Mostly, when you're going to have a mutation surviving, it usually means that your tests are either incomplete or bad. So uh, I'm going to take a very quick example of uh, a mutation testing uh, in, uh, uh, in action. That is, for instance, you have this method that takes two boolean, A, a and B, and you're going to have um, a result that is either 42 when both uh, inputs are true and zero in every other case. And you have your test methods, and you say, OK, if I run check on true and true, I expect 42. And if I run check on false and false, I expect 0. So obviously, there is something missing in the test. And when you run the mutation, you're going to have your A and B change into A or B. And of course, your tests are still going to be green, because you still uh, true and true is still true, and false and or, or false is still false. So to fix your test in this case, uh, you just need to add uh, a couple of more uh, cases to cover all your ground. So this is a basic example. Uh, you can you can have a lot of example, but we're going to get our hands dirty, right? And so basically, you have a plugin for uh, Android projects uh, that help you uh, run this. So um, you, you'll find it in the slides. Uh, I'll uh, post, post them on Twitter later. Uh, but basically, you have a basic plugin. Uh, it's very easy to add to your Gradle uh, project. Uh, you can configure it pretty easily, too. because So basically, you just have to say which classes are going to be mutated. So here, I just want to mutate every class is that, is, that lies in the com.example package. And you just define your uh, output formats. So I want both uh, XML and HTML format. And the result is going to be something that looks a bit like this. So those of you who already uh, use code coverage, it's going to be pretty familiar. Um, but instead of saying you didn't walk on the line, you didn't uh, cover the statement, it's going to say that a mutation on this line was not covered by the test. So let's take a, a closer look uh, live. So I took, um, my, um, I took one of the uh, Android samples, uh, Android architecture samples that are uh, available on GitHub. And uh, I uh, basically, if you take a look at the diff, uh, I only added the uh, mutation testing uh, plugin. 
uh, like I showed earlier. So first of all, the first part is just making sure that the uh, test works. So hopefully it's going to run. So I'm not sure you can read everything, but basically all the tests are green. So that's good. So now we're going to run the, um, the mutation framework. And basically what it does, it starts to analyze the, uh, all the tests, and it's going to try to find all the source code that can be modified uh, and that will impact the tests. So it tries to not change something that's not covered, uh, even though sometimes it still does so. And so here you have uh, um, just a report uh, that says uh, all the, uh, the, the, the surviving and killed mutation. But a better way to do this is to just open um, the report. So it's an HTML report that lies in the build folder. And so here, let's just zoom in. So here, you are, you, the, the, the coverage report is going to be um, uh, presenting that way, and you're going to have both the line coverage, so it's the code coverage, and the mutation coverage. And these two can give you uh, a clue on where to look for issues. Because uh, right here, the code coverage is not 100%. Uh, and so uh, this helps you, comparing the code coverage with the mutation coverage can, um, can show where the uh, issues lie. Like for example, here uh, in this package, we see that we have more code coverage than we have mutation coverage. So we can jump in actually, and we can see here that we have almost, we are more than 50% code coverage, but only 20% of mutation coverage. So if we take a look here, you're going to have the same, uh, the view of your code, and each green line is basically um, um, the, the pale green lines are going to be uh, mut not mutated code. Uh, the pale red line is not mutated code, but uh, not covered. And what we're interested in are these uh, lines, because here we see that when we, when we call the delete task here, so this part is correctly killed. So we, have, we had a mutation and it was killed, meaning that the test detected that the code was changed. But these two lines were not detected meaning that we could change the, uh, these two statements and nothing was uh, found by the test. So basically here, this means that we don't test that when we delete a task, the listener is warned, which is a pretty bad thing. So this, using this, you can actually find um, uh, the, uh, the way your test miss cases. So, let's go back. So first, I'm going to uh, answer some frequently asked questions. Uh, yes, it does work with Kotlin. <laughs> uh, because basically, this framework works on the bytecode. So it works with Kotlin, and it works with any other JVM language, because it, do, it just modifies the bytecode statement and not the source code. Well, maybe because I only tested with Kotlin, I didn't bother training with Jitten or Scala, but in theory, it should work. Uh, it's very configurable, meaning that you can change which mutation you want or you don't want applied on your code. You can change the number of mutation you want to run every time you do a mutation coverage pass. Um, and it ex it's extensible, meaning that you can write your own mutation. So this framework has uh, I, I, a, a lot of uh, mutations available already, uh, but you can have your own if you have some patterns that you want to mutate. Uh, but there are a few things to keep in mind when doing this. The first one is mutants won't find bugs in the code. They are just going to be able to reveal test issues. And mostly, it's going to reveal the edge cases that are not covered by a test. It's not bulletproof. 
uh, we saw some example of uh, um, a mutation not being dete detected by uh, the test, and it's perfectly okay sometimes. Uh, changing some statements won't change the logic actually. Uh, and it's not a viable metric because of that, uh, because you can still have some um, surviving mutations which don't uh, change the way your logic works. Uh, you can't refer to, the, to the, the output value and say, oh, I only have 50% of co uh, mutation coverage. This means that my tests are all bad. No, it doesn't mean that. It just means that half the mutations are still surviving. One, f uh, one thing that's important to know about mutation testing is that it only uh, simulates atomic faults. That is, it only simulates uh, removing a call to a method. It only simulates a single byte code, byte code statement. So it can change a single uh, math operation. It can change a single inequality check. It can change a single return statement. But it's not going to be able to simulate um, a complete refactoring of something. Like, for instance, if you write, uh, um, if you have, uh, let's say, a sort uh, algorithm, and you have your test running through it, it's only going to, it's, it's only going to mutate a small atomic faults, and it's not going to uh, create a new sort algorithm and make sure that your tests still work against it. Also, it's very costly, uh, because basically each mutation is only on a single statement. And uh, if your project is large, well, not even large, but if you have a, uh, uh, even a medium-sized project, uh, that could mean thousands and thousands of statements. So you can, of course, be exhaustive with this. Uh, most of the, uh, the framework and the one I presented uh, lets you have uh, four or five mutation uh, per classes, which is still uh, long, because for each mutation, it's going to run the tests against it. So <clears throat> if you have a very, very large code base, uh, the, the time spent on this mutation testing can be very, very huge. So my own recommendations about this uh, is to only use it locally uh, during a TDD process. So basically, when I want to develop a new feature or I want to change a new, uh, an existing feature, I'm going to work TDD. So I'm going to write my test, write my code, refactor things a bit. And once I'm satisfied with my feature and I'm satisfied with the test I wrote, I'm going to run a couple of uh, mutation testing uh, paths. And with this, I'm going to be able to detect if I missed some edge cases of if my, uh, my tests are incomplete and I miss some uh, verifications. Uh, but I only do it locally. Um, it can, it can be automatically triggered uh, by PR. Uh, so for each commit, you can say, OK, I'm just looking at which files were changed. And I'm going to use that to filter which class can be mutated. Um, it, it's fairly easy to do. Um, but I don't run it on a CI server for a couple of reasons. The first one is it takes a long time. Um, and uh, because we have a lot of developers uh, committing all day long, uh, of course, uh, this means that the longer uh, a run um, takes to validate a PR, uh, the longer you're going to wait for uh, the next uh, PR. Uh, the other thing is that uh, each uh, mutation coverage uh, pass is only going to test several mutations among all the mutations possible. This means that uh, two consequent uh, mutation pass won't have the same results. So this means that uh, you can't keep the values and make it viable. So of course, the coverage value is not shared with, shared with management, because each run can have a roughly different uh, output. And of course, it's not uh, absolute. And always take your results with a grain of salt. As I said, it's not because you have a mutation surviving that it means that your tests are wrong. Sometimes the mutation survives uh, for the good reasons. 
So these are the links to uh, the frameworks uh, I use. So the, base, the basic one is a P-test, PI-test framework. Uh, and you have uh, two uh, plugins. There is an Android Studio or IntelliJ plugin called Zesta that allows you to run uh, mutation testing on a single file, much like you know you have the green arrow inside your Android Studio and you can run a single test. Uh, with Zesta, you have a blue arrow and you can run uh, a single test with mutation testing. And the, uh, the other one which I uh, talked about in this uh, presentation is the P-test PI test plugin that works with Android projects uh, and allow you to uh, run a full pass on all your projects. So that's it for me. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention. And if you have any question, I think we have uh, time for a, a small Q&A. Yes, we have about three or four minutes time for any questions. If you have any, please line up in front of the microphones. In fact, I don't see a line. I don't see one single person standing in front of any microphone. I'm the only one. And I don't have a question since I'm not a technical guy enough I to... Think, I think there's a question here. Is there? Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. So first of all, thank you for the great talk. You're welcome. Uh, I've already added this uh, plugin, as you said, the test and the issue that I had is that I wanted to run the mutation test only for the methods I had unit tests for and the problem is that I got a very red line for the methods that had no coverage and I wonder if there is any way to run the mutations only on the methods you have unit tests for. Uh, I don't think that this, uh, this framework actually does it, but uh, you can still uh, trick the, um, you can trick the, you can, uh, let me start again. Yeah, you can uh, take the XML output of the uh, mutation report mm -hmm. and just filter all the uh, not covered, like for instance, um, here, uh, here you have, um, you're going to have the, uh, the report that says no coverage. And basically, you can, you can filter the XML report to remove all the entries with no coverage and only keep the entries that are not uh, of this kind. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. The next question from the other Hi. side. Hi, thank you for the presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, you said that you don't run it on continuous integration server because it takes a lot of time, it's not always reliable, and uh, it always has different results, if I understood correctly. Yeah? Yeah. So you recommend to, to do it locally, but then if I do it locally once, it will give me one, one result, then maybe I cover all these cases that I missed, then I run it again, that it, then it will show me again. Is this? Yeah, that, that's, that's what I say. It's, I, I actually, when I do it, I run a couple of paths uh, okay. to make sure that it's going to take different uh, mutation. So uh, this framework actually uh, keeps, uh, um, unless you clean your uh, output folder, uh, it's going to keep uh, a track of all the mutation it already tested. That way, uh, if you have a mutation that's already covered by your test, it's, go it's not going to try it, and it's going to try something else uh, the next time. Okay. And one more question follow up. Yeah. Uh, you said that it takes longer time. So let's say my units, all my unit tests run in two minutes. What range of uh, of scale I can count on? It, it, it is it three <laughs> times longer, or it depends how many mutations it, it does. The basic answer is it depends because uh, you can have uh, only uh, one single test uh, with sing one single class, but it it, run, uh, it runs in two minutes because uh, it does a lot of processing. Or you can have, I mean, it's okay. it depends, but it's mostly uh, the more code you have, the longer it's going to take. Yeah, exponentially longer, yeah, I guess. That's okay, it. thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Um, if I understand correctly, um, each line uh, in the code can be mutated or changed. Each statement uh, in the yeah, code. That is, you can have a line that says, for instance, uh, uh, result equals uh, A plus B minus C, the whole divided by D, etc. Yeah. So each operation is a statement that can be modified. And each statement can have probably infinite number of possible mutations. So no, no, no. Uh, each statement, uh, each a uh, statement can have only uh, uh, one or two mutations, like a plus, uh, A plus B will always be changed to A minus B, uh, because otherwise it's, you, you can't infer what's going to be 
going on. But um, if each uh, if each statement can be mutated, what does, does that mean that the mutation coverage uh, indicates uh, is a number indicating the number of statements and the number of mutations uh, applied to it? No, uh, the, the mutation coverage is basically uh, the number of mutations that, that are covered by the, 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 the percentage of lines that are covered by the test when mutated. So basically, if you have like 100 lines in a, in a, in a source file, uh, and it's going to try mutation on, on, the, on all the lines, and if, if the result is 80% uh, mutation coverage, it means that 80% of the lines when mutated are detected by the tests. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you again. You're welcome. <laughs>